was saying there to Harry, that great, you know, theologian, Bible scholar, Dumbledore, where he said, these are difficult times where we're going to have to face the choice between doing what is right and what was the last part, doing what was easy. Choose between what's right and what's easy. And that's kind of where the, the guy I'm going to share with you this evening kind of found himself, is having to choose between doing what's right and doing what's easy. And that's not always a, 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 a simple choice. So uh, I'm going to, to share with you some stuff. Here's some uh, about a guy named Carl Bart. And so the last time you guys were in here, you guys talked about or learned about a guy named Thomas Aquinas. You remember that dude? That was kind of weird and would just like blurt out weird things at weird times and people weren't were quite sure what to do with it. So we're making a big jump. Thomas Aquinas was in the 1200s. We're going to jump to the 20th century, so the early 1900s. We're making a 700-year jump in just a matter of a couple weeks um, to, to look at this guy named Carl Barth. Uh, there's a picture of him. Carl Barth, I know it looks like Barth, B-A-R-T-H, but it's Barth, like Simpson, if that helps you remember that. And so you can tell he's super uh, smart and studious because he is smoking a pipe. And that's, that's kind of the benchmark of the smarty pants. So uh, there's, a, there's a picture of that guy. And so if you, if you guys recall that uh, Thomas Aquinas was going after this kind of anti-intellectualism of the time that was saying that you couldn't know God through what we call natural revelation or through creation. If you guys remember that, I know we're only going back a couple weeks. But uh, that, that you could discern the creator being God from the creation. And so what we're going to see with a guy like Bart is that, te is that the teachings on God and Jesus uh, in the Bible, like it had gotten to a weird point from where Aquinas was in the 1200s uh, to the early 20th century uh, that maybe people who studied God's word were maybe too intellectual. Maybe they were putting too much uh, stock in their own intelligence or in uh, science or any of that kind of stuff. And so uh, Bart brought a big change to the theology of the 20th century. And so there's a good chance that most of you have never heard of this guy. Has anybody heard of this guy? Okay, a couple of you. So, all right, that's kind of what I expected. So you guys can fact check me on this as you know about it. But I want to fill in the gap because we're making a 700 year jump from Aquinas to, to Bart. And so there's our, our first screen kind of filling in the gap from, from A to B. If you've got that one, you can go to, to, to that slide. We're going to fill in the gap of those 700 years. So, so you kind of have an idea why what he did was important. So Strader's going to fill in the gap on some of these guys in the, the coming weeks. You're going to learn about guys like Martin Luther and Tom, uh, John Calvin and some of these other guys. But I want to make sure that, that you kind of know what's going on uh, in between that time period. So in the 13, uh, in like the 1300s through the 1500s, we kind of had this time in church history that was like the pre-Reformation and then up to the Reformation. If you're like, I don't even know what that means. The Reformation simply meant at the time there was just one church worldwide. And that church was called the Catholic Church. And Catholic, the word Catholic just means universal. There, so there was just one church in the entire world. And that was the Catholic Church. And there were some guys who just said, hey, can we like tweak some stuff? Can we maybe do some reforming? Uh, of some of the teachings of the church because it really hasn't changed in, you know, 1,300 years since Jesus left the earth. And so I put some names in here, kind of spread out across those 200 years. So the first name there is a guy named John Wycliffe. The next name is a guy named Jan Hus, who's like Hungarian. And then the third name there is a guy named William Tyndale. And those three guys primarily uh, did a lot of work in translating the Bible. The Bible was only in one language at the time, and that was Latin. And nobody spoke Latin besides the priests. And so there were these guys who were like, hey, can we at least translate the Bible into a language that people speak? And that's probably something that you've never thought of, that the Bible that you're able to read in English, that, well, that's not always how it was. Even for people who spoke English for several hundred years, they did not have the Bible in their own language. And some of these guys got in huge trouble for translating the Bible. And you're like, why? And I would say, exactly. But... That was part of the, the, the pre-Reformation. And then these other guys, Luther and Calvin, said, hey, can we talk about some stuff with the Catholic Church? Can we change some stuff? Can we address some of these things? And the Catholic Church didn't respond very favorably to it. But you had this change, this reforming of the church. And so after that time, you start to see some of the denominations that we see now, like Presbyterians and Anglicans and Methodists and all that. And that kind of comes out of that time period. So... 
That's what you need to know about the 1300s and 50, through 1500s. From the 1500s to the 1700s, you have this time period in Europe called the Age of Enlightenment. Has anybody learned about that in school? The Enlightenment? Like the scientific method, you familiar with that? That came out of the Enlightenment. That's like the Enlightenment's golden child is the scientific method. And so what happens during the, the Age of Enlightenment is kind of the rise of reason. So it, it turned, uh, everything kind of turns more scientific the more that people discover in science and the more they learn through scientific method. And what you start to see, not only in those academic fields, but it starts to shift over to the church, is that there's this change because everything now has to be proven scientifically. And so then it starts to make a change and it gets into uh, the, the, the people who are training to become pastors and the people who are training to work in the church. And so it becomes less about God's word and it starts to become more about uh, man and what man has to think about the Bible. And so over this time period, you start to see some guys come in and questioning things because we cannot take God to the laboratory and boil him down. And at the end of the experiment, we look in the jar and like, yep, that's God. We've got him there. So for the Enlightenment, they're like, well, since we can't really do that, can we really even believe that God exists? So you start to see a rise of some of that during the time. And then this next section, this is kind of what the Enlightenment's effect had on the church. Kind of in the 1800s and moving forward. I forgot to put that on there. But like the 1800s moving forward. And I threw a couple names up on there. There's no test on any of this stuff. But I'm just going to give you some good German names here this evening. So the first guy there is Kant, not Kant, but that's what it looks like. Uh, and Kant was this guy who said that, you know, kind of based in that scientific thing, that says we can't really know. There's things that we can know and there's things that we can't know. And the things that we can know is the stuff that we can, like, scientifically discern so we can smell things and see things and hear things. That's the stuff we can know. But we can't really smell or see or hear or touch God. So since we can't really know him, can we be confident that he exists? You guys following me? That's huge for the church during this time because then it begins to start to have people think, well, yeah, that's true. We can't really know. Is the Bible just really a bunch of fairy tales? And so Kant sets that up. The next guy's got named Schleiermacher. It's a good German name for him. I mean, we live amongst the Germans here in Northwest Ohio, but I have yet to meet Schleiermacher out here. And Schleiermacher kind of takes it one step further and says, you know, religion necessarily isn't something that we can know, but it's something that we feel. It's just the way that we makes us feel about ourselves. And so we can't really know what it is, but we can have this, these feelings about stuff. And so he was even, he would even go so far that says Jesus isn't necessarily the Son of God because you can't, you can't do that. God can't take the place of man. Like that just doesn't make sense. But Jesus was the guy who thought about God the most. And so that made him the best. So you start to see these kinds of ideas kind of coming out of the smartest people in the area, and it starts to creep into the church to, to eventually, because all these great minds who keep saying all these things, it gives rise to this thing that's called liberal theology. And I'll tell you what that means. So liberal theology does not mean it's a bunch of guys who believe in God and go to Democrat, okay? So you have to separate the word liberal from, from that. It, it's more of a mindset, it's more of a structure. And so those are just some bullet points about what liberal theology is. So liberal theology is more of a reconstructing of our beliefs in light of modern knowledge, again, kind of that stuff. The more we learn about science, the more we grow suspicious of who God is, the more we discover archaeologically. And if we haven't found the remains of the city that was in the Bible, then maybe the city never existed in the first place. You follow me? So that's kind of part of liberal theology. Another part of it is freedom of the individual Christian to criticize traditional beliefs. Why do we do this? And sometimes it's good to ask questions about that, but to say, why, why, do we, why is it important that we believe that Jesus resurrected? Like these would be uh, liberal theologian kind of discussions. Well, do we really know that Jesus raised from the dead? Is that really even possible? I haven't seen anybody raised from the dead, have you? And so that's the kind of stuff that they would that they would talk about and criticize traditional beliefs, and then Christianity becomes more of this like practical, ethical thing. It's not necessarily we do this because that's what Jesus desires for us. We do it because it's the right thing to do. We do this because it's the right thing to do. Okay, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the, the right thing for me to do is not just like walk around and punch Ben in the face and then punch Terry and then find Jordan and punch him and run because he's bigger and stronger than I am. But 
Like, that's the right thing to do. You shouldn't rob somebody. You shouldn't attack somebody. You shouldn't shoot somebody. Because that's the right thing to do. But it's not based in God's word. It's just based in you just don't do those things. It's like stuff your mom would tell you. You know, don't touch the hot stove. Don't play with electricity. Don't do this because you're not supposed to. But it's not grounded in God's word. So they're kind of separating that and making it more of just this ethical thing that we do because it's the right thing to do. You guys get that? Is that, you following me? And then the last part is that it's based on a foundation other than the authority of God's word. Like here at Crossroads, we didn't have this core value that says the word is essential, meaning that we try to structure our lives based on God's word because we believe it is God's word. But these guys are like, nah, I'm not, I just think it was just some guys who just wrote some stuff. So that kind of mindset is starting to permeate the European church and even parts of, of American Christianity, and that kind of started to become the standard in a lot of these places for over 100 years, and then my man Carl Bart kind of stepped in at the beginning of the, the uh, 20th century. So here's a quick, I, I've got a little bit of a bio there on your sheet if you grab one of those, and so Bart, I'll get to, like why is it important for you to talk about all this stuff? We'll get there in just a second. So Bart is born uh, there in the late 1800s in Switzerland, He's the son of a professor of New Testament church history at a college there in Switzerland. And then he studied under some of the best uni at the best universities and learned under some of the guys who taught a lot of this stuff during the day. And then after he got out of college, he was sent. Because in a lot of those churches in Europe, they would assign you to a church. So, like, I went to Bible college, and it would be like me graduating in 1999. And then they're saying, okay, now you got to go to... Somewhereville, Indiana, and take a church. Like they assign you. I don't get any say in it. They're like, congratulations, here's your diploma. You got to go over here and, and preach to these people. So, when he found himself in this town in Switzerland, because that's where he was assigned, he began to notice a couple things while he was getting to know the people and he's preaching messages on Sunday and he's teaching, he's talking to people. He began to realize a couple things. One, all of the stuff that he learned in college is not beneficial to any of the people sitting in the pews on Sunday. He was in a very working class town, and he came from this very highbrow educational background, and none of the stuff that he learned and studied and wrote papers on and took tests on, none of that stuff was making any difference in anybody's lives. So he was having a fault with that. He was having trouble with that. He's like, I can't buy it. None of these people care about any of this stuff. And then he second noticed, because you understand uh, Switzerland is like right next door to Germany. We're in the early 1900s. He also started noticing that Germany, the next door neighbor there in Switzerland, was becoming increasingly militaristic. And Bart, all of his colleges that he attended were in Germany. And they were becoming increasingly militaristic. They were building up this army. They were becoming this military power in Europe. And all of his professors were throwing their support behind this. And in fact, he came across in 1914, all of, all of his old professors had endorsed the guy who was running Germany at the time, this guy named Kaiser, and they endorsed his war policy. And they endorsed Germany entering into World War I. And this was a problem for him because he didn't see that type of behavior being endorsed in the Bible. He didn't see that type of behavior being endorsed in God's word and say, yeah, it's okay for us to go out and, and, and go to war, and it's okay. Jesus didn't act like that, and Jesus didn't tell us to, to go to war. So he has this real struggle with this stuff. And so, like our clip, Bart becomes faced with the choice between choosing what's right and choosing what's easy. And here's what he does. He comes to this conclusion of all of the guys that I looked up to, all my teachers, and if you think of the teachers that you have and you got 10 years down the road, and then they like, did something horrible, and you're just like, man, I trusted that person. I really appreciated that being in the classroom, and then to see them almost kind of flip on you like that. He's faced with this choice between what is right and what is easy, and so he believes something must be terribly wrong with what they believed about God if they can so quickly compromise everything they believed just to fall in line with Germany going to war, what we call World War I. So because of that logic, he's like, I can't trust what you guys taught me. I can't trust your Bible knowledge. I can't trust your interpretation of the Bible. I can't trust any of that stuff. So this drove Bart deeper into God's Word, specifically the book of Romans. And he began studying the book of Romans, and he started like going over it. And he started crafting his own book that we would call a commentary. It's just somebody who's much smarter than I writing 
a bunch of stuff about what he sees in God's Word. A lot of us guys who work on staff here have commentaries that just kind of gives you some explanation about what's going on in that part of the Bible. So, right after World War I happens, this book on Romans comes out that he writes, and it lights this match that kind of blows up the, the church world in Europe at the time, because Bart declared this, like, all-out war on all of his former professors, and, like, writes in there, like, these guys don't know what they're talking about, that all this method of studying scripture is wrong, they don't believe in any of it, and this is what's right, and that, and, and so all of these guys are like, whoa, 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 hey, and so... They start getting hot, and they start getting mad, and they're like, this guy is a nut, this guy is a religious fanatic, you know what he's talking about. So this one book that he put out to try to help people who were trying to understand God's word blew up <laughs> and, and in the face of all of his, his, his former professors and got pretty much all of the educational elite of Europe mad at him because he was like almost like pulling the curtain back on him, like, this is, this is, these guys are a bunch of clowns. Uh, with this stuff. And so he criticized liberal theology for turning the gospel into a human religion when it was in fact God's word. This is what it is. It's not what you guys have made it out to be. So all of those guys in the day, they, they, they thought that um, they taught that, that no one could know about God. Hold on, let me back up. I can't read my, my own writing here. What had been taught that one could know about God and talk about him in, in, in human terms? Remember with Aquinas? We can know about God from nature. We can know about God from, from the universe and from creation. And Karl Barth put a hard nope to that. He was a hard no one. You can't know God through nature. You can't even, I'm using the word, analogize about God. Like you can't say God is like this. God is like this. God is like that. You can't even talk about God like that because he is something completely other than anything you can imagine. So for us to even try to put him in human terms is incorrect. And this is kind of a classic joke because of some of the theology of the day when Bart was teaching uh, at a university in Germany that, that he came in one day and because of the, the some of the other theologies of the day that were like, oh, we can know God and God's in the rocks and God is in the trees and and instead of God being this, this completely different something else from us, everybody was kind of, you know, ascribing to something. So he came into his class one day, and he found this written. One of the students, you can go to that next one. God, someone had written this on the board because they knew it would get under his skin. So he comes in one day, and he sees that somebody in class had written, God is, a, God is other people. God is other people. And so everybody's in the back kind of laughing at it because they saw that he didn't like it, so he kind of looked at it for a second. Went over to the board, grabbed a piece of chalk, and made a comma. Go to the next, the next slide there. And he changed it by adding a comma. He's like, okay. So he changed it to where it says, God is other, comma, people. God is something completely different than anything you can think of, you all. So God isn't in everything else. He's completely beyond anything that we can talk about. That's how committed he was to saying God is, God exists, but he is outside of the realm of our language. We have to uh, treat, treat him with more respect. We have to talk about him with more reverence. And that God's ultimate revelation was Jesus himself. Like the best way for us to know God is through Jesus. That's it. That is God's ultimate revelation of himself because God came in human form and died for us. And that's it. That is the ultimate revelation, which is Jesus. And so then, like I mentioned, the, the critics of the, of the book said, this guy's a, guy a wacko, this guy, you know, this guy probably doesn't, you know, brush his teeth in the morning. And, uh, they, 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 were, they, were not, they were not interested in it, but it was a huge corrective for uh, the 20th century. And Bart continues to write stuff about the 20s and 30s, setting God's word over and above human reasoning and accusing liberal theologians of selling out to the Enlightenment and that they made the gospel respectable. He used those words like, you made the gospel respectable. And by making it respectable, meaning it could become a, a scientific almost class. Like you go to chemistry class, and then you go to science class or some sort of biology, and then you go over to theology class because it's treated scientifically rather than treated as being God's word. But that makes it respectable in the, in the academic world over there. And he says, by making it respectable, you stripped it of all its power. The gospel no longer has any meaning because you made it respectable. So Christianity for Bart can't be this objective science, but it has to be this understanding of God's revelation in Jesus, which was made possible by grace and faith alone. Now, 
I probably alluded to it a little bit, but this is where Bart differs a lot from Aquinas. Again, Aquinas was the guy that says we can know God through general and natural revelation from nature. And again, he was a hard no on that. Bart, Bart wouldn't have any of that stuff. I think I put in your timeline there. Like he writes this thing called No. Is that right? Did I put that one in there in 1934? He writes this response to a buddy of his. So you could be friends with somebody who doesn't necessarily believe everything you believe. Do you maybe you have friends like that? And Bart was good friends with this guy, Emil Bruner, who was really into, you can know God through nature and all this stuff. And he just wrote this answer that just says, no. <laughs> and he published it. He's like, no, an answer to Emil Bruner. And he just kind of like rips Bruner to shreds on this. And it kind of fractured their relationship. They kind of reconciled before Bruner died, but like he, was, he just wasn't happy. He made a hard stand, made that hard choice rather than that easy choice. So he was this hard pass on it. He opposed every attempt to gain knowledge from God, of God from nature, culture, because he argued that all of that natural theology in the 1930s was the root, I'm going to use this word, was the root of what he called religious syncretism. Do you know that word, syncretism? S-Y-N-C-R-E-T-I-S-M. That just means, if you know somebody who's like this, syncretism, you usually find this in religion, where someone's like, you know, I like some of Jesus' talk. And I like some of Buddha's teaching, and I like some of the New Age, and I like some of this, and I kind of like put it all together in a soup. That's syncretism. And he's saying, anytime you start traveling down that path, it's going to lead to this. That's how like hardcore he was about this stuff. And he also said that that kind of stuff, that natural theology, in his own mind, in his opinion, was largely responsible for the anti-Semitism of the German church. Now, at the time, the German church in the 1930s was created by the German state, which was run by the, who controlled the Germany in the 1930s? The Nazis, that's right. So the Nazis create their own church and say, this is the German church, and the German church does what the Nazi party says, and so the Nazi party did a lot of bad stuff. And so he's saying, this natural theology is the whole reason these clowns exist. Because you didn't put your trust in God's word, you started believing that we could just follow whatever we want. That's why we're stuck in this bad situation. So in fact, Bart was so deeply committed against Hitler and the Nazis. I have that on your timeline there. In 1934, he writes the majority of this thing called the Barman Declaration. It's just kind of based on the town where they all signed this thing. And what it does, man, this thing was hot. Like he, as far as just the thing, the, the, the charges he levied, he kind of lobbied against Hitler and the Nazis that he said that Jesus is the only Lord for Christians and criticized any German Christian who elevated Hitler to the status of Messiah. So he's saying, which was pretty much all of the German church at that time. Hitler had everybody so scared, there's like, fine, do whatever you want, just leave the churches alone, let's do Which, that was a real problem for him because he's saying, man, if you have elevated some leader, some political figure, somebody like that, if you elevated them to the savior of the world, or of Germany, or whatever, you have created an idol for yourself. And because he refused to swear allegiance to Hitler, again, he's still teaching at a, at a German university, because he didn't swear allegiance to Hitler in the Nazi party, the German government fired him from his teaching position. Now that is cancel culture. That is problematic. That is the kind of stuff that if, if, if the government starts firing you for stuff in this country, we have a huge problem with that in Germany. Sorry, man, we control the churches, we control the universities, we control all this stuff, you're out. But he made the choice between what is right and what's easy. And so he returns back to his native Switzerland and taught in university for the rest of his days until his death in 1968. Um, but I, I, give us all, I gave all of that kind of historical stuff to say, you know, the church started taking a real hard left, like a hard left turn in how they treated God and how they treated Scripture over the course of a couple hundred years, and it was kind of dying on the vine in Europe, and Bart kind of had to <laughs> resuscitate the, the church uh, during that time. So what are some takeaways? Before we kind of release you into your groups here in the next couple of minutes. What are some takeaways? What can we learn? What can we take away from, from Karl Barth's life? So the first one, I would say, in following Jesus, we may be faced with choosing between what's right and what's easy. In following Jesus, we may be facing 
a choice between what's right and what's easy, back to our, our video clip at the beginning. And it's not a simple decision. It's not. You can't just go, well, of course we choose right every time. I don't choose what's right every time. I'm sure you probably don't either. Bart, the first time around, faced the decision between siding with his mentors and his professors, how he was trained, everything that he had learned, that, and their support of Germany's war efforts in World War I, or he could side with what he saw in God's Word, what he was seeing happen in the church, in the hearts of his people there in Switzerland. And he could address that in his book in Romans. So he had to make a choice. He, he made this choice over and over. And then the second time around, I just mentioned that he had to choose between teaching in a university, it's a pretty good gig, good job, good, good pay, or <laughs> he, could, he could keep his job there and uh, side with the German church and its endorsement of Hitler's and the Nazis, or he could stick, <laughs> he, could, he could stick with his convictions and he could stick with his commitment to the lordship of Jesus and publicly condemn the German church for throwing its support behind Hitler and also denounce Hitler, and it cost him his job. It cost him his livelihood, but it didn't cost him his soul, which is more important, obviously. It's a huge thing that we can take away from it. And, and so as far as you're concerned, and I know that you're in high school, but, but maybe you're, you are making big decisions right now. You're making big decisions about college, and am I gonna make, maybe I'm being caught between making the, the right choice or making the easy choice, or maybe I'm kind of caught right now in the tension between maybe what my friends would have me live out or believe or think, and maybe between perhaps what my parents want me to believe or think, and guess what? Maybe maybe sometimes it's somewhere in the middle, and I'm not saying to like go home and disobey your parents or any of that kind of stuff, but I'm just saying sometimes we have these hard decisions to make, and I don't envy you if you have those decisions to make, but sometimes we have to make that decision between what is right and what is easy, but just remember that God's faithful, um, that it it, it may not be easy, but he will give you the strength you need and the peace you need to make those decisions when you're faced with that. Secondly, it could be possible. You remember last week when Aquinas said, don't, don't turn off your, your brain? You're right. You can use your brain to, to learn and to, to worship God. But Bart would say, you know, it could be possible for us to overthink or overanalyze God's word. Just as Aquinas encouraged us to use our brain for Jesus. Bart's issue, especially with what was going on in his, his day, was that maybe so too many people were committed to using their brains on the faith and the scripture, that the scripture lost all of its power because it was being analyzed through this filter of the enlightenment. What can we really know? Like there's a, there is a, I don't know if it's true or if it's just kind of a myth, but uh, Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States, you're familiar? Okay. So make sure. Even if you know him from Hamilton, I don't care. As long as you're familiar with the, if you're familiar with the name. So there was a because Jefferson was really committed to the Enlightenment principles, and so there is this long-standing tradition that because things like miracles and things like that that can't really happen in real life, that, that Jefferson took the New Testament and like went through the Gospels, and every time he saw Jesus do something miraculous, he had that cut out. Because he just didn't think that believed that didn't happen. So in the Gospels, when Jesus dies for Thomas Jefferson, Jesus is dead. That's the end of the story. There's no there's no resurrection. So there, that the commitment to that 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 was the problem that was going on in Bart's day. And so um, I guess I would just say don't don't feel like if you don't fully understand God's word. And when I was your age, I totally didn't understand God's word. But if you don't feel like you have all the eyes dotted and the T's crossed. That's okay. And don't, don't back yourself into a corner where you feel like you have to understand everything about God's word, therefore none of it, none of it's good. It's all, it, it all makes sense or none of it makes sense. At some point, I would encourage you, even if you don't fully get it or you don't fully understand it, just to be willing to step out on faith and believe God, take God at his word, and, uh, and, and he'll be faithful to you on that. Finally, third takeaway. It is important for us to understand a person's context before we make a judgment statement about his or her life. It's important for us to know a person's context before we make a judgment statement about his or her life. So Bart was, was, was not perfect. He, he was not uh, with, without his criticisms, especially by both liberal and what we would now call evangelical theologians. So the liberals say, man, I think you 
or put too much stock in God's word. If you think it was actually, you know, inspired by God himself, and then the evangelicals would say, well, you're, you haven't gone the full route and said you think it's all correct, all 100%. And so, like, neither one of these groups had, were, like, super thrilled with him. Um, and, he, and he seemed to have some contradictions in his writings. Um, there's, a, there's another funny story that a, a guy was reading one of his books, and he wrote him a letter. He said, Professor Bard, I think you've got some errors in your writings. You seem to contradict yourself here and there. And he pointed them out. He got a letter back from Bard. He said, hey, thanks for pointing out my contradictions. You missed a few. And then he, like, <laughs> went through his own book and said, here's where I contradict myself here and here and here and here. So even he realized that he was like, look, man, I, got pro I get it. I'm not perfect either. I'm not, I'm not without error. So if we were to read some of these teachings today uh, from Bart on Jesus, on the Bible, on the Holy Spirit, with no context, if we just treated it as if it was written last week, we might read some of that stuff and think, this doesn't quite sound like what Strader teaches about on Wednesday. It's close, but it's a little bit off. But the reason I showed you all that stuff at the beginning is to say, if you keep this guy in his context, when nobody else around him believed any of the scripture. They just thought it was just another textbook. It was another scientific material to be analyzed and to be, to be kind of shredded and ripped apart and let's see whatever remains in it. If you take him in that context, I would say for him to make some of the stands that he took on God's word, it would probably make him the most biblical guy in that area, the most biblical pastor or teacher in that. So we have to examine somebody in their context first before we can fully understand what's going on. The same way that we would tell you if you were studying God's word that if you were in the book of Ephesians or if you were in the gospel of John we would say you need to understand what's going on in and around in the context of God's word in order for that passage to make even more sense. So it's important to know all that stuff. Uh, it's important to know somebody's context before we make a snap judgment about him. Because I, when I first learned about this guy all these years ago in college and in, uh, graduate school, there was a lot of like, well, he doesn't, he doesn't totally believe everything we believe here. I'm like, yeah, but if you put him up against the rest of these guys, you didn't believe any of it, you'd probably believe the most out of it. So let's not, you know, kick this guy around too much. So anyway, those are your, those, that's, uh, that is, that's Karl Barth, kind of what he did for the 20th century as far as believing in God's word and what it means. And so I am uh, going to pray and then dismiss you guys to your small groups. You got some questions. And I've been told that if your group so chooses to go outside because it's nice, you guys can do that and make that decision. That's great. But thanks for letting me share with you guys. Let's pray. God, thanks for, uh, thanks for giving us the, a mind that we can uh, use, that we can use for you. I'm great for guys like Thomas Aquinas and, and Carl Barth who use their minds to uh, engage with your word and then encourage others to do that as well. And I know that, that Barth's not perfect, nor is Aquinas or any of these guys. Lord, we're all fallible. But, uh, but I appreciate someone making a stand for what is right over what's easy. And so, so, so God, for these students, as they're making decisions uh, next month, and then uh, tomorrow, in the coming years, whether that's college, whether that's what's going on after, after I'm done with school, what am I doing this summer, all these things. But when they're when faced with a tough decision between choosing what's right and what's easy, God, would you by your spirit empower these students to make a bold stand, whether that be a question of faith, a question of, uh, of morals or ethics or any of these kinds of things, God, would you empower them by your spirit to stand up for what is right rather than what is easy. It's hard work, uh, I freely admit. Uh, but God, by your grace and by your spirit, we can do that. We can make the right choice. So uh, God, would uh, there be a good discussion in our groups? Uh, thank you for your work, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, gang.